Because gracious God, you tell us that one day every, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God, we thank you for that power that comes in his name. We thank you that through his sacrifice, our, our chains can be broken. That you set us free to be the people you have called us to be. So that we can change our homes. So that we can change our communities. So that we can change our world. So that we can be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth, and the meditation of all the hearts, souls, and minds gathered in this place. Be acceptable unto thee, O God, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I don't know if it's just a guy thing, but I can't stand uh, commercials when I'm watching TV. So I'll be watching a show or I'll be watching a basketball game. Any Irish fans out here this morning? Hey, they're looking good, I'm telling you. You should be proud. But, you know, I could be watching a show, I could be watching a sporting game, and, um, and, and the commercials will come on, and I will start channel surfing. Anybody else like that? I mean, I, I, just, I don't care what I'm watching, I just can't stand to watch the commercials. Now, if I'm watching a show with my family, they hate it, because inevitably I'll be a couple seconds late back to the show, you know? But to me, I'd rather be a couple seconds uh, late to the show than to watch all those commercials. However, there is one commercial that has really caught my attention recently. Um, it's a State Farm commercial, maybe, maybe you've seen it. And even though they're trying to, I know they're trying to sell me insurance, but really I, lo I love, I love how, the, how they're doing it. I love the message that, that they're giving. And the message is this, that love changes us. That when we fall in love with someone, we start doing those things we never thought we would do. The commercial is only about 30 seconds long, so instead of explaining it, how about we just watch that State Farm commercial? Although we need volume. <laughs> so if we just start over with volume, that'd be great. And I, see, they can almost say it. <laughs> Is it going to work? We had it first service. So I know it's, it's possible. Some of you are staying along with us. There we go. Never letting go. I mean, <laughs> nice job up there. Um, but I mean, isn't that the truth? We fall in love, we get married, we have kids, and, and all of a sudden we start doing things we never thought we would do. You know, instead of the sports car, we go out and buy the minivan or the SUV. All of a sudden we have kids and, and we put up with the crayon markings on the wall. Maybe because of your family, um, you move out of a certain area or you move into a certain area. I mean, we have, we have some furniture. I have vowed. Uh, in, we have some furniture that needs to be replaced, but, but until all four of our kids are out of the house, we are not replacing that furniture because they are, they are hard on the furniture. And so, you know, I, it's just going to be a while before we get new furniture until at least the kids are out of the house. But, but, but when you love somebody, it changes you. And you start doing things you, you never thought you would ever do. And this morning we are in week three of a four-week sermon series Asking ourselves the question, how do I know? How do we know if we are in love with Jesus? And that might be the most important question we ever ask ourselves. And this morning we're looking at the idea that when you are in love with Jesus, when you have fallen head over heels in, in love with Christ, when you have begun a, a relationship with Him, then it will change you. 
you'll become a different person. You'll start doing things you never thought you would ever end up doing. I want to read to you from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Paul is telling us when we love Jesus, when we begin to have a re personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it changes us. We become new people. We become a, a new creation. Our sins have been forgiven. We've been reconciled with God. And we have been set free to live the life that God is calling us to live. Now, I should, I should add this caveat to all that, though. As nice as it would be to give your life to Jesus and then just wake up the next morning and you're a total new person, the, the exact person God wants you to be, 100% who God wants you to be, as nice as, that, as nice as that would be, that's not what happens. It's one of those things where slowly and gradually we become new people. You know, almost instantly you can have a, a new lifestyle, you can have um, things that, that were broken that you're no longer addicted to. Not that your life can't change dramatically, but for you to be 100% the person God wants you to be, it's not going to happen overnight. In the church, in the Bible, we call that sanctification. Hopefully each and every day we become a little more, a little more like Jesus. Hopefully each and every day we, we are transformed from the person we used to be to the person God wants us to be. So this morning what I want to do, I'm going to lift up three ways in which our love for Jesus transforms us. There are, there are more ways than this, but I, I think in our scripture lesson this morning there are three specific ways that our love, our relationship with Jesus changes us. Number one, loving Jesus transforms our relationship with God. Verse 18 tells us we have been reconciled with God. Now reconciliation is when a broken relationship has been healed. And when it comes to God, we are the ones who broke the, who broke the relationship. We're the ones who have scarred the relationship because of our sin, because we wanted to do things our way instead of God's way. We are the ones who broke the relationship, and it seems like we've been doing this. Humanity has been doing this ever since the Garden of Eden. In the Garden, God, God tells Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree, ex any tree except from the tree of knowledge. I mean, have, have at it with all the other foods I've given you, but you can't eat from this one particular tree. And what do they do? They go to that one tree, and they pluck the biggest, juiciest piece of fruit they can find, and they eat it. God tells us to worship him and him alone. But what do we do? Seeming, we seemingly worship everything but God. God tells us to love our neighbor. And there's so many people in our culture today who don't even know the names of their neighbors, much less love them. So we are the ones who broke the relationship. But the good news is that even though we broke the relationship, God's the one who restores it. We are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ and through what Jesus has done for us upon the cross. So Jesus took our sins and he nailed them to the cross. Jesus took our brokenness and he healed us. Jesus took this relationship that was strained with God and Jesus put it right. I like how, how Paul summarizes it in Colossians chapter 2 verses 13 through 15. And this is the, the living Bible translation. Paul says, you are dead you are dead in sins, and your sinful desires were not yet cut away. Then he gave you a share in the very life of Christ. For he forgave all your sins and blotted out the charges proved against you, the list of his commandments which you had not obeyed. 
He took this list of sins and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. In this way, God took away Satan's power to accuse you of sin, and God openly displayed to the whole world Christ's triumph at the cross where your sins were all taken away. It's through Jesus' sacrifice, by Jesus taking away our sins, cleansing us of our sins, that we can now be in a right relationship with God, loving Jesus. It transforms your relationship with the one who created you in the very beginning. Second of all, loving Jesus transforms our emotions. Loving Jesus transforms our emotion, emotions. When, when, you are, when you are stuck in sin, when you are stuck in sin, it scars you emotionally. And Jesus, Jesus just doesn't want to forgive you of your sins. He wants to also rid you of the guilt, the self-loathing, and the remorse that comes with the consequences of sin. God, through Jesus, wants to replace those, those negative emotions with joy and peace and happiness. And God wants to transform you. God doesn't want you to feel guilty about your past. God doesn't want you to hate yourself because of who you're not. God doesn't want you to feel remorse. God wants you to live an abundant life. Now, as I said earlier, a lot of times, you know, when, when God transforms us, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it takes time. And I think this is one of the hard things. Some of us, you know, it's easy to know that Christ loves us, but do we love ourselves? Are we willing to get past those, 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 those feelings of, of guilt and remorse that, that, that sin causes? You know, sometimes I think the way God ultimately heals us of these, these sins is sometimes just to expose them to the world so we have to deal with them. And that when they are exposed, we, we have to confront them. And we learn that we don't have to be identified by them any longer, but that God has healed us, God has forgiven us. And we can be identified as his children. My, my great-grandmother on my mother's side was affectionately, she's passed away, but she was affectionately known as Ma. <laughs> I mean, this is my, my Mississippian side of the family. Um, she was Ma. She was my great-grandmother, but she was Ma. But for most of her adult life, for about 60 years, Ma lived with this, this secret that nobody knew about. And I'm really not sure how she kept it a secret. <laughs> But she did. I mean, she was born, again, in Mississippi, a very conservative part of our country. She was born in a very conservative time in our country. And the thing, that the secret that she lived with for about 60 years was the fact that, that she was pregnant before she got married. Not, none of, I mean, none of her kids knew this. Maybe so, some people knew it way, way back when, but, but she really kept it a secret. How? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm really, you know, uh, when talking about her, her wedding date, I'm, I'm really not sure she told the truth to everybody. <laughs> on her 80th birthday, on her 80th birthday, we had a big birthday party for her. And someone put together a photo album. And in the photo album, they actually had a copy of her, of her marriage license that they found, as well as the birth certificates of her kids. And it was during the birthday party that someone was looking at those. And all of a sudden, they put two and two together. And they, they just blurted it out. Hey, Ma, I didn't, I didn't know you were already pregnant with Fulton before you got married. And you should have seen the horror on Ma's face. The blood drained from her face. And after a few seconds, the, the tears started to flow. Because even after all those years, 60 years later, she, she still felt ashamed of what she had done. After 60 years, she really, she, she really even though she knew that God loved her, I'm not sure she, she loved herself enough to forgive herself of that which she had done. And this was a godly woman, and, and she was afraid of what we would think. 60 years later, she was afraid of what we would think about her. And how could you think anything bad about Ma? I mean, she was just a great Christian woman. She, she went to church every Sunday. She read her Bible every morning. Every morning she prayed for her kids and her grandkids and her great-grandchildren. She knew Jesus loved her. 
But she kept this secret. That just kind of ate away at her all these years. And really the blessing of all of, of, all of that on that particular day was that all of a sudden she could see her family. And she saw her family looking past to that which she had done. She saw her family still love her and tell her, you know, why, why are you worried about this all these years later? She saw her family able to forgive her. And she could forgive herself. But I think the way God did that was by, was by exposing it. You know, the Bible tells us that God tests us, right? I think sometimes he tests us by exposing our sins to others so that we can fully, um, fully heal from those sins. So that we can deal with them. So that we can receive forgiveness from God and then forgive ourselves. Because God wants to transform us emotionally. He doesn't, want to be, he doesn't want us to be anxious about our past lives. He doesn't want us to be identified with those past sins. We are new creations. We are new people. We've been set free. In verse 19, it tells us God no longer counts our sin against us. And I'm telling you here this morning, whatever you have might, whatever you have done or not done, whatever you have failed to do, however you have not lived up to, to what God wants you to be, as followers of Jesus, it tells us, it promises us, God no longer counts your sin against you. The chains are broken as we just sang just a few minutes ago. Your chains are broken. You've been set free. Don't identify yourself with those past sins. Identify yourself as a child, as a son, as a daughter of Jesus Christ. And don't let it, you know, don't, don't sit with those sins for 60 years before you finally deal with them. Know that God forgives you. Know that, that you can forgive yourself. Third thing, that loving Jesus does. Loving Jesus transforms our passions. Loving Jesus transforms our passions. And I'm telling you, when you love Jesus, your, your, your life becomes so much more exciting. So much more exciting when you love, when you love Jesus. So much more exciting when, when you begin a relationship with Christ. Verse 20 of our text tells us that we become Christ's ambassadors to the world. We become his ambassadors, his spokespeople. And I don't know about you, but I know for me that has, that has caused me to do things I never thought I would have done. Because I love Jesus, you know, I've, I've gone to such places, and these are just three examples, but I've gone to such places as the, as the White Mountain Apache Indian tribe to share the love of Jesus with them. I've gone, I've gone to Haiti, like many of you have, to, to share the love of Jesus with them. Every Thursday at 2.30, I go to Eastside Elementary School to tutor and to share the love of Jesus with those kids. God, God wants to transform, transform your passions so that you become ambassadors of Christ. About a month or so ago, I, I watched a a movie on Netflix called Ring the Bell. Anybody see the movie Ring the Bell? It doesn't surprise me. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually a pretty decent movie. Um, it's one of those movies made by, um, by a Christian church, a Christian movie company. And so, I mean, the, the storyline is somewhat predictable. Y y you know how it's going to end. And the acting is all right. Actually, I've seen a lot worse acting. The acting's okay, but the storyline is awesome. And it's really a family-friendly fri movie. Um, I... I uh, Highly recommend it. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's, it is what it is. Again, it's, the storyline is a little predictable and such, but it's got, just got a great message. Um, it's about um, this sports agent who finds himself in this small, backwards country town. And while he's there, he, he discovers this guy who just a couple years earlier had been like the hottest baseball pro prospect in the country. This guy was a pitcher. He he could throw 100 miles an hour. Every, every scout was salivating at, at signing him. But then he just kind of fell off the face of the earth. And nobody, nobody knew where he went. 
Well, this sports agent found him in this small town just by, by coincidence. And come, come to find out, this, this guy who had been the hottest pitching prospect, who's actually the, the son of missionaries, and he, re, he felt a, real, a, a strong call of, of God not, not to play pro ball, but to start a, a ranch for, um, for boys who were orphans. And the sports agent comes up to him one day after finding out that he's a Christian, after finding out why he left baseball to impact these boys' lives and to tell them about Jesus. And the sports, a- sports agent came to him and he just asked him, he said, he said, did you ever think about the platform you could have had of how many people who would have listened to you if you were pitching on the mound in Yankee Stadium. You ever, did you ever think about the platform you could have had if you were pitching on the mound in Yankee Stadium? And this guy said to the sports agent, he said, you know, honestly, I think about it every day. I think about it every day. But then I look into the eyes of these boys. And you see here, here at the ranch, we have, we have a bell in the front yard. And when one of these boys gives his life to Jesus, he goes out and he rings the bell so that everybody everybody knows that he made the most important decision of life, so that everybody knows that he gave his life to Jesus. And when those boys ring the bell, you've got to understand, he said to him, you've got to understand, when when I hear that bell ring, that this is my Yankee Stadium. You know, as Christians, the greatest thing we can do is share the love of Jesus. The greatest, the greatest thing we can do is be Christ's ambassadors to the world. And when we, fo- when we find ourselves sharing the love of Jesus to someone, I mean, that, that becomes our Yankee Stadium. That becomes our Super Bowl. That becomes our World Series. That becomes our March Madness. When we become ambassadors of Jesus Christ. There's no bigger high in this world than standing on the mountaintop, hearing the bell ring because someone gave their life to Jesus because you were Jesus to them. Loving Jesus it transforms, it transforms your passions. You know, in just a little bit, we're going to have um, we're going to have lunch. It's, it's uh, focuses on mission. And if, if if you are not currently doing a mission, find one. Doesn't matter if it's to the school or down south in an Indian reservation. Or Haiti, it doesn't matter. But where where is your Yankee Stadium going to be? Where are you going to have the thrill of sharing Jesus? Because I'm telling you, it is the greatest adventure. The greatest adventure you could ever be on. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you have given to us. and for the love that you've enabled us to give back to you. God, we just pray that that our loving you, our loving Jesus, that it might change us, that the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon us, that it will change our relationship with you, it will change our emotions, it will change our passions, so that we can become the ambassadors of Jesus Christ so that we can find our Yankee Stadium, so that we can find our World Series, so that we can find our Super Bowl, so that we can find our March Madness, March Madness and discover that it was here all the, all, all the time, all the while, just waiting for us to be the arms and the feet and the voice of Jesus. Thank you for your love. May you transform our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Would you please stand with me as we join together in our closing song?